Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1546, 1546, and Of course, this is a very significant presidential election year. And I tell you, the two sides could really, I I don't know that they could be uh, much farther apart in terms of what their ideas of tax policy are and, you know, fiscal policy really, but we'll we'll zone in specifically on on the tax aspect of fiscal policy not to be confused with monetary policy which is what our federal reserve does fiscal policy is the taxing and the spending and when you look at the two sides of the aisle they are really quite staggering for example on the corporate tax side now we all know that you know Trump in his landmark tax plan, he really lowered corporate taxes and incentivized companies to bring their activities back onshore. They were offshoring a lot of this. They are still, to a large extent, offshoring a lot of their money. But some of that has repatriated, and that's, in the long term, good for the U.S. See, sometimes, you know, you always want to incentivize the right behaviors, Right, those of you who have kids or spouses or employees, <laughs> right, or animals, if you have a pet, you want to incentivize the right behavior. Look, we're all animals at the end of the day, and uh, we're all going to be incentivized by uh, certain things and and disincentivized by other things. So, with wealthy people who have activities offshore and wealthy companies who have activities offshore and have money offshore, you want to get them to bring those activities and that money back onto your shore. And the way to do that is not by raising taxes, it's by actually lowering them. So you become the bright, shiny object. So you become the desirable place to do business. And so on corporate taxes, here's the difference, right? And much more significant on other areas, but we'll just start with corporate, right? We'll go maybe, well, semi-alphabetical here. (laughs) So the corporate taxes, Trump says 21%. Joe Biden, when he's awake, says 28%. On income taxes and payroll taxes, Trump says 37%. Biden says, and are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Biden says 52%. Wow. That is absolutely astonishing. We are moving toward, if that happens, we are literally talking about the type of tax climate you had before Margaret Thatcher in the UK, where people and money were just fleeing the UK and just getting out of that environment because it was so heavily taxed. Think about it. Can you imagine if your federal tax bill is 52% and you live in the Socialist Republic of California, where they want to raise the highest tax rate to, I think it's 16.4%. So you would be paying 52% to the federal government. You'd be paying 16.4%, I mean, this is if it all happens, to the Socialist Republic of California. And if you live in New York, 
it's about the same, okay? You know, <laughs> so so just call those the same if you live in Connecticut, you know, you know, any of these places, right, that are just crazy out of their mind. Oregon, uh, you know, it's, it's just insanity, insanity. This is the kind of stuff you would be suffering from. And then imagine California or the feds, but California wants to do it. And, you know, it's more likely it could happen in California more quickly than at the federal level, right? They want to do a wealth tax that would say, listen, we don't care if you made no money last year. If you made zip, zero, nada, nothing, right? Just because you have money, we're going to take it. And, you know, just because you have assets or money. Now, not to mention that that money wasn't already taxed many times over on the path to accumulating it. Certainly you paid income taxes. Certainly you paid all sorts of taxes on everything, property taxes, use taxes, you know, blah, 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 million taxes, just to get to the point where you could accumulate the wealth. But now they say that every year, you got to give a little bit of that to the government. And what if you don't have the cash? What if it's not liquid? What if it's a, a family farm or a family business and it's got a valuation attached to it, right? Everything does. Everything can be valued. And then they say, well, you know, may, maybe you had a bad year where you've got this this business, for example, and the business is worth, uh, you know, a few million dollars, Not a certainly not a big business by any means. And then the, the government in California says, okay, pay your wealth tax. And you say, well, we had a terrible year last year. We lost a million dollars last year. How come you're asking us for money? Well, because you have an asset. And because you have the asset, you got to pay us. Well, we don't have the money. You know, we only have the asset. Oh, okay. Then you better refinance the asset. And if you can't refinance it, you better just sell it and liquidate it. And what if it's a bad time to liquidate it? I mean, this is like, this is like the biggest wealth destroyer of all. And that is the D word. That's the biggest wealth destroyer of them all. What's the D word? You've probably heard of it. Divorce. Divorce. Don't get a divorce, okay? Because a divorce is the biggest destroyer of wealth that's ever been known. And it's not, and I'm not saying that because he got half, she got half, whatever, right? I'm saying it because it forces people to liquidate assets at inopportune times. You never want to liquidate an asset at the wrong time. You want to liquidate at the right time. You want to be able to time that liquidation to do it at an advantageous time, obviously. But here, you could be forced with a wealth tax, and they want to do it at the federal level too. Just listen to the Marxist AOC and uh, Nancy Pelosi and all the rest of them, right? They could force you to sell assets. This is what happens with the state taxes, folks. Estate taxes, when somebody dies and the kids have to pay tax, the heirs have to pay tax, they force them to liquidate what could be a good business, family farm. Uh, That's the common one because farms are notoriously illiquid. Uh, But any kind of business, it doesn't matter, doesn't have to be a farm, could be a widget factory, widgets. Widgets are us, incorporated, and they're forced to just liquidate that, lay everybody off, and, you know, sell the business to pay the tax, just to pay the government. That's why that's so destructive. Okay, so you'd pay 52% to the feds, 16.4% to California or New York or whatever leftist state you might find yourself in, and then you'd pay maybe a wealth tax, not to mention you paid a whole bunch of other taxes. Don't forget you paid sales tax, property tax, a million other taxes, right? You paid gas tax every time you filled up your tank. Remember when Comrade Obama wanted to tax the electric cars that he was in favor of? He said everyone should drive a proletariat electric car. And he said, well, because they're not buying gas, they should pay per mile. Well, wasn't that the whole point, Obama? 
is to, you know, be better for the environment, to drive an electric car? Uh, <laughs> well, no, you got to pay per mile because you're not paying gas tax, right? That's what he was saying. Unbelievable. Where do they get this stuff? These people are out of their mind. Okay, what about small business taxes? Okay, so we went over corporate taxes, income and payroll taxes, and then we talked about state tax and wealth tax, but small business taxes. Well, Trump says 29.6%, but Biden says 39.6%. Hey, you might as well just tack on another 10%. I mean, heck, if you're giving money to God, God can live on 10%. That's the traditional tithe. When you tithe, it's 10%. But the government needs like 66% of your money. <laughs> I mean, this is insanity. Unbelievable. Where do they get this stuff? So Trump, 29.6%. Biden, 39.6%. Okay, what about capital gains and dividend taxes? Whoa. Hold on to your hat. Hold on to your hat. Right here. You got your hat in your hand? Hold on, because it's going to blow off. Trump says 23.8%. And sleepy Joe Biden says 43.4%. Oh my gosh, almighty. And not only that, Joe Biden says, we're going to eliminate the 1031 tax deferred exchange on real estate. So when you sell your real estate now, you're going to pay us 43.4% when you sell it because that's the capital gains tax, okay? And whatever you have left over, if you want to reinvest, you can. You know, with that uh, 57% you got left over, 56.6% actually is what you have left over after you pay Joe Biden. So folks, this is just a mind-boggling presidential race that we're in. These two candidates, in terms of their tax policy, could not be more different. Now, Regardless of what your political persuasion is, you just have to ask yourself the obvious question. What behavior would be incentivized under Trump, even if you hate him, hate his guts if you want, because he does say some wacky things, I'll be the first to admit, but hey, Joe Biden says some wacky things too. <laughs> like, can I smell your hair? Or do you kids want to feel my legs? <laughs> I mean, you know, he says some weird, weird, weird shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trump says offensive stuff, but Biden, oh my gosh, it's creepy. Creepy, creepy. Anyway, what behavior would be incentivized with each of these administrations? It's, it's clearly obvious. Clearly obvious. All right, we got part two of George Gammon today. Let's get to him. Remember, you can get the Meet the Masters recordings, jasonhartman.com slash masters. Thank you to all of those who have purchased them, and you will really, really love them. I'm getting good feedback so far. I'm sure there'll be more to come. So that's great. And be sure to contact our investment counselors for any questions you have. Also, of course, they can give you links to uh, webinars for the Alabama market asset protection, the funding webinar. We've been talking with a lot of clients about the funding they've received, and I'm hearing good results on that. We did that a few months back, and I wanted to kind of watch it play out and see how happy people were and so forth. And uh, it's, uh, it's looking good. I'm hearing good things. You know, people are saying they got about $30,000, $40,000 in funding right away, and then uh, they are getting more as time goes on. But right away, they got about $30,000, $40,000 in zero interest rate funding. Uh, so uh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And they can use that uh, for investing and so forth. And if you want to check out that webinar, it's at jasonhartman.com slash fund. That's jasonhartman.com slash F-U-N-D for fund. And without further ado, let's go to part two of George Gammon. George, you, you did a, a fantastic video recently about the things the Fed, or really the powers that be in general, don't want us to know. Do you want to talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, well, three three things. First was 
that you always hear that deflation is bad and it's the boogeyman. And I think I think it's actually good if you look at deflation in and of itself, especially if it's produced by free market forces, which if we had a free market capitalist society, uh, we would see deflation and it would be very healthy deflation because entrepreneurs are out there producing goods and services and they're trying to compete with one another and they're doing it more efficiently and they're produce, producing things at lower prices. And that's just, that increases demand. That's really kind of the line in the sand. You got to ask yourself, is, is, is this type of deflation increasing demand or right. is it decreasing demand? And that's where, you know, the, most of the deflation that we have now, it, it's kind of a scary thing because of the amount of debt that we have in the system. But I would argue that that's like saying that, you know, heroin isn't the problem. Uh, the, the problem is that XYZ person is addicted to the heroin. Mm-hmm. Right. The heroin in and of itself isn't the issue. Uh, the next one was that inflation is good. We always hear that uh, from the, the government or the Fed especially, or central banks, that they have, they have these inflation targets. Right, 2%. They, they want, yeah, we've yeah, all 2%. heard that. Yeah. And, well, yeah, well, now that's, of course, a, a moving bogey as well. I don't know if you heard Powell's latest speech. Yeah. Oh, that that is earth-shattering. You know, I made a big deal about that on my podcast either yesterday or the day before, but this is a sea change, potentially, folks. The Fed has just lifted all the constraints and they've come out and said, we're not going to forecast and act in a forecasting uh, or react to forecast. We're going to wait until we see it. And then we're going to change. And, you know, that's like a, a giant oil tanker. It takes a long time to turn that big baby around. And if the Fed, you know, if this is their new philosophy, then I mean, that is uh Fairly, they're pretty always, risky, always, I'd say, right? They're always moving the target. It's nonsense. Yeah. First, yeah. first, it's like, let's get up to 2%. Yeah. And then once they get up to 2%, they say, well, actually, it's got to <laughs> average 2%. And we are under 2% for 10 years. So now we can run at 10% and it doesn't matter because it'll just yeah. be an average as though yeah, it's, right. how, how that makes sense. I don't yeah. know. Then they'll and, change the time frame. They do the average over. Or yeah, they'll they take out a couple of years that are anomalies that they don't like and, and make it weighted, a weighted yeah. average versus an average average. So, yeah, no. Exactly. Great. So yeah. this is just the, the next step in the long line of uh, just, I don't want to call them lies, but just kind of uh, the smoke and mirrors game yeah. that they're playing when they just won't admit that they, meaning the government, has to have inflation. It's their, It's the path of least resistance. For a government that's 27 trillion in debt, and this debt is just going to be ever crushing them um, as it increases with these deficits that we're seeing in COVID. But um, you know, so you hear that this inflation, this low type of inflation, is actually good. And then the third thing that I went over is who actually owns the Fed, and uh, I I focused on the New York Fed, and um, the usual suspects are there. You know, the top three. I think it was Citi, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs. But the, um, the next two, I, th- I think, would really shock a lot of people in the sense that it was HSBC and mm-hmm. Deutsche Bank. So a lot of people, when I bring up, you know, let's look at the Fed's P&L, not just their, their balance sheet. They say, oh, that's nonsense because they only get a 6% dividend and everything that they, that they make as far as profit from their, I don't want to call them investments, but we'll say their balance sheet goes right to the treasury. And I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I mean, the mm-hmm. Fed has a surplus account that they even admit to that they have money in that's in excess mm-hmm. of what they repatriate to right. the government and, and after the dividend. That's one. But then what most people aren't thinking about is, listen, just because they might not get a, a billions and billions and billions and billions in distributions as, as owners, think about all the money that they're making or the profit they're making as a result of maybe being closer, having the ear of a Fed governor or being oh, like a crony, sure. yeah. you know, I mean, you, you got you, I mean, 2008, it's a great example, you know, they get the bailouts uh, from the government or the Fed. And now most more recently, you know, we had the repo spike in September and this, it goes up to 10%. I mean, if the, if the Fed wouldn't have stepped in right there, I don't think people understand. I mean, we're done. The banking system is is done. They there's no way that you can have the dollar funding market operate with 10 percent interest rates. And so they come in. They basically bailed out the banks right there, in my opinion. And then you have what we saw in March. And it's not just now the Fed. Now it's the government coming in with their stimulus and bailouts that uh, that are, are are like a government put is what I call it now. And and that's 
bailing out the banks to a certain degree, but then you look at all the investment banks and they're, they have record profits. And is it any surprise because they think there's a Fed put and, you know, to they, they, I think you could argue that there could be, whether it's psychological or it's direct or implicit. But uh, so their downside is capped, but their upside is almost limitless. So you look at the risk reward and that's all benefiting the bank. So it's, those are the, it's socialism for the rich and the giant corporations, you know, it's uh, especially the big banks. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of the, the three things that I outlined. But as far as the deflation example that I gave, it was the late 1800s. Mm-hmm. And we saw that uh, everything, I, I think, went in the right direction. Uh, as an example, the, uh, uh, the average hours worked for the few positions that I saw went down pretty much across the United States. The wages went up. In some case, wages went up dramatically, like uh, 50% just in the span of 10 years from 1890 to 1903. And so then you say, okay, that's a good thing. But keep in mind that from 1865, to the year 1900, we had almost 50% deflation, 50, five, zero. Post-Civil so, War era, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, uh, well, and, and gold standard, really. Yeah. So yeah. what you have is, you know, 52 cents in 1900 could buy what a dollar could buy in 1865. So you have the prices of goods and services going down, 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 while people's wages in nominal terms, uh-huh. not just real terms, but in nominal terms, are going up, 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 and up. And then you have GDP increasing dramatically. GDP from, excuse me, from 1865 to 1900 went up by almost 100%. Mm -hmm. And and that's in nominal terms. And people say, yeah, yeah, but the population increased. Right, look at the per capita GDP. That went up as well in nominal terms. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how can you, well, that's a rhetorical question. You can't produce an environment that's better for the poor and middle class where their lives improve more dramatically than something where their wages are going up and the cost of what they buy daily is going down consistently at, say, a 3% clip per annum. I mean, that that is could, the, the could, best. Go ahead. Go, I was just going to say, could you attribute any of that deflation for that long period to the Industrial Revolution, though? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, that was... I think most of it you could attribute to that. So that's the free market. That's why I was saying when you have a a normal, well, not a normal, but a a free market where it's very few regulations where people can actually compete and you have, you know, Jupiter's uh, creative destruction that's actually allowed to take place and you have all these things, you don't have manipulated interest rates, you have hard money. You have sound money. That is absolutely key. Then what happens is guys and gals like you and I go out there and we produce whatever we can produce to pursue our own self-interest and we compete with one another. We're very competitive. I know you're competitive. I'm extremely competitive and we're always going to try to gain market share. We're going to try to make more money. The way we do that is by producing a good or service that people value more than the money in their pocket. And Mm -hmm. so we're always trying to find better ways to do things. We're always trying to find ways to create new technologies to deliver our goods and services to the general public at a cheaper cost. And that benefits everybody. And as those prices go down and their wages stay the same, not go up, that increases demand. That doesn't Uh decrease demand. So it's the fact that we have an economy now that's based on debt, asset prices, and confidence. That's the reason why we we could get a deflationary spiral that would be a bad thing because people can't get they can't get debt and they need the debt to further increase their consumption so that's an example of a demand going down because there's just no more debt or there's not an expansion of debt but that's not deflation's fault that that's the fault of the underlying economy mm-hmm. so a lot of it you know, plays in whether there's inflation, deflation, whatever. And, and, you know, you can divide it up between consumer prices and asset prices for sure. And, you know, I know you have a lot to say about that and and some great stuff there. These interest rates, George, are insane. I mean, they're just, it's just got to be a completely artificial market in the interest rates. Where do you think we're going? And interest rates are just notoriously hard to predict because, you know, especially when you have policymakers intervening all the time, right. uh, you know, where, where do you think we're, we're going with this interest rate stuff? And, and I'm sure you believe it's dysfunctional and has causes a lot of malinvestment and such and, you know, people to do 
improper things that they wouldn't normally do. And obviously it hurts savers and usually older people. But, you know, what are your thoughts about that? I just thought I'd throw a few things out there, give you something to chew on. Well, let's let's think through the Fisher equation. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if you're you're familiar with the Fisher equation. Very, very much. simple, but, but it has a dramatic impact. So the Fisher equation is just, uh, if my memory serves me right here, it is the real interest rates plus the uh, rate of inflation would give us nominal rates. So you've got, let me write this down here. So we've got the real rates, real interest rates. Because because there has to be a cost to the use of money because when a lender loans the money, they have an opportunity cost because they can't use the money for something else. Thus the basis of interest rate, time value of money, et cetera, right? So that's fair. And then you take the real rate of inflation and you add it to that opportunity cost. And that should be the interest rate in my eyes. Yes, that's correct. That's basically the Fisher equation. An easier way to look at the equation, I think, is it was the same equation is if you take nominal rates minus inflation, that gives us the real rates. Everyone, everyone, that's pretty much common sense right there. Mm -hmm. Right. So, if the Fed pegs the rate at zero, so they peg Fed funds at zero, and let's say that we actually have deflation, that the economy, we have all this debt, and the economy is trying to get it out, of, it's trying to flush it out of the system. So as an economy, we're having deflation. Okay, well, if they're pegging it at zero, they won't let it go negative. If we have a, let's say, a negative two rate of deflation, well, what that's doing to the real rates is it's increasing them, right? And if we have increasingly high real interest rates, that makes it harder for people to borrow. That makes the money more expensive. So the only way, the only release valve for the, the government, if the Fisher equation is true, which it obviously is, is to allow the rates to go negative. So this allow the, the Fed funds rate to go negative and therefore that would allow real rates to go back to zero or to negative where people could actually afford to take on more debt you see so my point is the feds backed up into a corner where if and i'm just saying if the system stayed the same way as it is today meaning that they had to abide by the federal reserve act and so that that's a whole other topic but what i'm talking about is them not being able to take bank reserves and inject it directly into the economy through just, let's say, a Fed coin and bring it to your app. So that's a whole other topic of conversation. And I think they'll go around the Federal Reserve Act. But if they abide by the way the system is set up now, let's say, the Fed would have no choice at some point than to take rates negative. They, they, they have to just because of Fisher equation. Because if deflation is going down because of this over indebtedness, and I'm not just talking about consumer prices, I'm talking about assets as well, Mm -hmm. Uh, then the real rate of interest, like we said, goes up and up and up and up. But if you have the real rate of interest going up while you have deflation, that just feeds on itself. And that creates a a positive feedback loop that gets really, really ugly really fast. So they'd have Mm -hmm. to take and they'd have to get rates uh, further negative to opening up the affordability to to increasing debt with uh, consumers and businesses in the real economy. So, yeah, and home yeah. buyers. Yeah. Home buyers, everyone. Yeah, so that's kind of, uh, I'd have people look at the Fisher equation if they're trying to figure out what's going to happen with interest rates moving forward. Now, then you'd have to handicap on top of that what are the chances that the Fed circumnavigates the current system, especially based on what we've seen them do since uh, since repo and since March, where they pretty much abandoned every single thing that is written in the Federal Reserve Act. They're buying junk debt. And uh, I've read the Federal Reserve Act, and I can promise you nowhere in the Federal Reserve Act does it say that the, the, the Fed can buy a corporate debt or corporate junk debt for that matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously they're, they're doing it. So yeah. if they get around that, then they can create inflation without having to rely on the commercial banking system. Because right now, the main way that they can get uh, M2 to increase, meaning more currency units chasing the same amount of goods and services, is by the, the banks lending new money into existence. Right. By sure. creating loans. Yep. So the deflationist argument is, well, the banks aren't lending, 
And there's no consumer appetite for debt because we have these positive interest, positive real rates, right? That's crushing the economy. And therefore, there's no money that's being created. Money's being destroyed. And that's deflationary. That's basically the crux of their argument, right? Mm -hmm. But what they're not considering, they might be considering it, but they're giving it a, a low probability where I would give it a high probability is at some point the Fed will look at Japan They'll look at the ECB, the Eurozone. They'll look at these negative rates and they'll, they'll say, listen, we cannot take rates negative here in the United States because we have the, re the reserve currency. And we have this infrastructure, meaning the bond market, that is completely reliant on rates being positive, at least right. at zero. Once it goes negative, yeah. it's not like the German Bund going mm -hmm. negative or, or JGBs. It's a right. whole different. It's a whole game. different animal. I agree with you on that. Um, yes, they're going to try to get around it. Yeah, you probably have more to that thought, but I just didn't want to forget to ask you this because I think my viewers and listeners want to know George's opinion on this. Um, we were talking a few minutes ago about the target rate of inflation, you know, 2%. The, the Fed has publicly stated, you know, that's that's their, their goal. You know, that relates to the Phillips curve and the relationship between inflation and unemployment rates. But there does seem like, I have a feeling you're going to disagree with this, but there seems like, like a valid argument you can make to have some inflation in the system as long as the highly manipulated GDP is increasing and the population is increasing. You know, it seems like there's a there's a logical argument to have some inflation that's relative to population and GDP increases. Does George Gammon think so? I have a feeling he's going to say no. But what is it? what do you think? Yeah, no, <laughs> I, no, I, I don't. I don't see the upside for that. Okay. I guess the, the argument is the economy needs more money if it's growing. Yeah, it right. More there's more people. There's more that. a bigger economy. More people. Yeah, but I'd just say that you just you just divide the currency units you have into a lower amount. But so let's say we had dollars right now. We had let's say we had a hundred dollars in the entire economy, and we're like, shoot, this is getting cumbersome. We don't have enough currency units to transact because I have to wait for that guy to sell his cow in order for me to have currency units to trade to this person. <laughs> right, it's, it's being restrictive, right? Uh -huh. Well, I just say, okay, well, let's not increase the amount of dollars. Let's just create quarters. Mm -hmm. Let's create yeah. dimes. Let's create pennies. And that's how I get around that. Yeah, right, 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 right. And it's interesting also that there's this giant coin shortage going on, which makes me suspicious that there's there's something behind that, either a digital currency on the way, which I, I think that's going to happen, obviously, at some point, at least. China is certainly moving in that direction. Smart for them, bad for the people, though. Or just the fact that it's just too expensive, or there's going to be a lot of inflation in the system, and those coins are going to be meaningless. I mean, why, you know, it costs, I think it costs 1.6 cents to produce a penny. Like, you know, how did we get here? This is just obvious that there's massive inflation in the system. Yeah, but, and I know, think... It I think that that's a great point. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about with the Fisher equation and how the Fed has painted themselves into a corner where they, they have to take rates negative, but they can't take rates negative because it blows up the whole system. Yeah. So how do you get around that? Well, you ban cash. And then what right. you do is you have, let's call it UBI or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever that's funded yep. by- Universal basic income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, So it's, but it's funded by the Fed's balance sheet. So right. that's a, a direct- way to get around the banks to inject more currency units into the mm -hmm. uh, real economy without the banks having to create more loans. Yeah. And so I, I think that's kind of going to be their rationale. Um, obviously, they're going to sell it as this is for your security, this is for your yeah. safety, right. this is for yeah. benefit. It's this to is, avoid terrorism, drug dealers, yeah. human trafficking. The yeah, freedom it's dividend, such. right? It's the right. freedom yeah. dividend that right. you deserve as an American. So yeah. this freedom dividend is $2,000 a month, but in order to get it, you've just got to download the, the freedom the dividend yeah. app on your mm -hmm. phone, yeah. and then you're going to have a bank account with the Fed, mm -hmm. just like JP Morgan, just like the TGA, the Treasury General account, just like the primary dealer banks. Jason Hartman, well, you might not because you probably opt out like I would, but yeah, right. <laughs> average Joe, let's say, is going to download the app and they're going to have a, an account with the Fed. And the Fed is going to create new bank reserves, just like they do with, with J.P. Morgan when they do quantitative easing and they buy treasuries. 
And instead of the Fed buying assets from you, they're just going to simply increase the amount that's in your uh, account by a thousand dollars with bank reserves. And, and that'll then- be your UBI, your universal basic income right there. And then you go on the phone and you got to spend that money on the phone. And guess what? If they don't like you or you commit a crime or, or you know, thought to have committed a crime, they'll just shut you off and you'll have, you won't have any spending privacy at all. They'll know every, you know, unit you spend somewhere. You and know. where you spend it, how you spend yeah. it, how fast you spend it. And then if they don't see velocity increasing, what they'll do is they'll just reduce the amount of time that you have to spend your freedom dollars. or your, They'll your- put an ex- expiration date on right. it to discourage saving. That's right. Unbelievable. That's right. Yeah. yeah. They could say, okay, Jason, if you don't spend this $2,000 in 30 days, it expires. Oh, it's gone. Just, just like your frequent flyer miles in your airline program or yeah. that gift card that you didn't use, you know? Yeah. yeah. Really scary stuff, George. You think we're going there? Yep. Yeah. I, I don't think they're going to have a way out. I mean, if you are under the assumption that the Fed has any level of intelligence uh, in the 900 PhDs at the Fed, and that's debatable. But you, you can't, if, if you and I were at the Fed and they said, hey, Jason George, we need to create inflation because we have to bail out the government. How are we going to do that? Well, what you and I would most likely do is go, we'd study Japan. We, mm-hmm. We'd study uh, the Eurozone. We'd figure out, okay, why didn't this work? Why hasn't Japan been able to get it? And then we, we'd sit there and we'd go over the, the – obviously, they have more uh, access to more data than you and I do. Yeah. So if you and I can figure this out, right. I mean, they've got to be able to figure it out. Oh, sure, yeah. And then so they're reporting to the, the powers that be, and they're saying, okay, this is why Japan didn't create inflation. Okay, how can we get around this? And the only answer is to get around the commercial banking system and get velocity up. And even that might not work. But uh, that's that's kind of the hail mary. So if the, the only other option really is is belt tightening in austerity. Mm-hmm. So if you think that you know with politicians, especially in the United States, they're always going to take the path of least resistance. Of course, always. Yeah. And so think about how politically palatable that would be for a politician to to go out there to their constituents or to go on you know, Fox News or or CNN or whatever, and say, hey, guys, you know what we need to do for the next 10 years is we just need to um, produce more than we consume. Right. And we need to tighten our belts. And we need to go through the 1930s. That's that's very old fashioned and nobody would do it nowadays. And you guys need to live beneath your means. Yeah. You need to, your standard of living has to go down. Decrease dramatically for the next 10 years. Or what we can do is we can just give you money to spend every month. Which right. do you choose? Yeah, <laughs> obviously, we all know what they're going to choose. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's crazy. It, it really is. Well, George, uh, you know, just wrap this up for us. You know, are there any, I'm sure there are questions that, you, you know, I didn't ask you, of course, that maybe you just want to say anything. Wrap it up with some, you know, closing thoughts for our, our listeners and viewers, if you would. Well, I always say that in today's time, you can be prepared or you're going to be a victim. And I think what we're talking about with uh, not just inflation, deflation, everything that's going on in the Fed with uh, money printing, quote unquote, you've got to look at hard assets. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just and I don't care whether you're a gold bug, silver, if you're a real estate guy or gal. You just you you might obviously you want some some dry powder there in case we get uh, you know the stock market going down you can take advantage of that but but you've got to have hard assets because you just don't know what they're going to do and we know that it's to their benefit they're incentivized to create not just inflation but a lot of inflation right yeah. and therefore you don't want to be on the other end of that if they're able to achieve it so. Uh, again, obviously, you're the real estate guy, so I'd defer people to you. And I'd be very careful about the real estate as well. I mean, these urban areas, oh, I, too, and, yeah. and social unrest, I just yeah. I just don't think you want anything yeah. to do with that, especially, I and mean, we didn't Completely talk about the wealth tax in California and all this nonsense. Oh, yeah. So you got to be very, very, very careful. But uh, start considering hard assets right now. I also like commodities. And as you point out uh, very well, 
and you have for over a decade that all a house is is just packaged commodities. Yeah. So I'd encourage people to not only understand this stuff, but to start uh, figuring out how they can apply what we're talking about to their current portfolio or maybe their their everyday lives when it comes to you know the urban areas and social unrest. That's pretty much what I'd uh, end on. Yeah. I, and, and George, I would agree with you. See, hard assets, I like real estate the best or the commodities that make up the real estate, the copper wire, the steel, the glass, the, the lumber, the petroleum products, the concrete, et cetera, all the ingredients of a house. Those have intrinsic value, regardless of what any currency on earth is doing. Everybody just needs those intrinsically. They have their own value regardless of being indexed to a currency like the dollar or the yen or the euro or whatever. So I agree with you there definitely and stay away from the urban areas and stay away from politically left-leaning areas. I think we can say with certainty that the left-leaning areas are literally becoming, to use a Trumpism, shitholes. And yeah. it's it's just my home state, the mass, vast majority of my adult life, the Socialist Republic of California, it is so sad to see what is happening to that beautiful state. And yeah. they're, they're just ruining it. I mean, the, the policymakers are just destroying that state and especially the urban areas within the state. So, you know, you look at San Francisco, you look at Los Angeles, where I grew up, especially bad there, but just the state in general. And, you know, you look at New York, yeah, it's just unbelievable. I I mean, I I just cannot, there's just no excuse. And these mayors, these left-leaning mayors of these cities, they should be indicted for not protecting the property and the people that live there. That's their solemn duty is to do that. And they've they've let this descend into a state of anarchy. I mean, these businesses are being ruined, lives are being ruined, people are being assaulted, killed, attacked, this is unbelievable that this is happening in the U.S. Yeah, that, that's the best way to say it. And uh, again, you can just ignore this. You can have cognitive dissonance. You can try to rationalize it. Yeah. But if it's you not do going that, away. Yeah. You, it's not going away and you're going to be a victim. It's just Yeah, you really are. George, you have a, a fantastic group that I'm a member of, and I, I just love it. That's kind of the pro version uh, that you offer. Uh, why don't you tell us about that? And give people a link where, where they can find out more. Sure. So that's a partnership deal I have with Lynn Alden mm-hmm. and Chris McIntosh. Lynn Alden is uh, an extraordinary mind. She's a, a, a research analyst, I guess you could say. She's huge on FinTwit. And then Chris McIntosh has been a, a fund manager for, for many, many years. And they, they, they see the world in a very similar way to you and I, uh, to say the least. So we set up this online forum for people. It's called Rebel Capitalist Pro. It has research from Lynn and Chris. We do live streams for members where they can ask myself, Chris, Lynn uh, questions. And then uh, the user generated content is fantastic. And then it's just a, a great resource for people. But I, I, I always call it a sane space. Mm-hmm. Right. Because we have all these safe spaces at local universities. Right. Yeah. And, and I call this a sane space because mm-hmm. for people like you and I, you know, we go online and you go to your Facebook feed or something like that. And it's just filled with just insane. Yeah. Insanity. Yeah. yeah. Whenever you go online. So this is a, a way for uh, people who kind of see things the way we do to mm-hmm. congregate to help each other and then to use that research to to be prepared and to make more money and to not only survive but thrive in a world of uh, out of control central banks and big government. So that's uh, georgegannon.com uh, forward slash pro. And I, I'm chuckling because that's George's tagline, <laughs> how to how to survive and thrive in a world of out of control central banks, good stuff. So the link again is georgegannon.com forward what? slash pro forward slash pro and that's your rebel capitalist pro group yeah yeah. good stuff george hey thanks so much for joining us thanks for having me happy investing
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.